Good evening from Palm Beach Atlantic University and the Lemieux Center for Public Policy. I am Deborah Schwinn, president of this university, and with me in the studio is former U.S. Senator George Lemieux. Remotely joining us is our special guest speaker, Admiral James Stavridis, NATO's 16th Supreme Allied Commander and the 15th Commander of the U.S. European Command. Welcome, Admiral Stavridis. We're so appreciative of you joining us tonight for this important discussion. Geopolitics in a time of global crisis. And we look forward to the time when you can visit us in person on our beautiful campus of Palm Beach Atlantic University. It's my great pleasure on behalf of the Board of Advisors of the Lemieux Center for Public Policy to welcome my friend, Admiral James Stavridis. Admiral, welcome. So as we all know, we're in the middle of a COVID virus. And so we ought to recognize both the challenges of this moment, but we also ought to keep it in perspective. If you go back 100 years ago, the world faced what was then called Spanish influenza. And as terrible as COVID is, we ought to recognize Spanish influenza was worse. Spanish influenza ultimately infected 40%, 40% of the world's population. And it had a mortality rate over 20%. Those are staggering numbers. And uh, we ought to keep in mind the fact that every 100 to 200 years in human history, there's a pandemic. And we deal with them. We overcome them. And we will overcome this one as well. One of the challenges for the United States in dealing with this COVID emergency, next slide, is that simultaneously, we have a new administration coming and taking power. The center of it, of course, is the 46th to be president of the United States, Joe Biden. And he's assembling a quite remarkable cabinet. I know every one of the people on this slide and, and many of his top leaders, because for seven years, I worked for the Obama-Biden administration as a four-star admiral, as Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. So one of the things I'll weave into this talk is a sense of how they will approach the immense challenges of leadership that they're undertaking. Next slide. So right about now, you ought to say, OK, Admiral, got it. We've got COVID, a pandemic, and we've got a new leadership team in the United States. What do you think? What are going to be the geopolitical outcomes? And what are the leadership style that we should expect? Well, let me start by showing you what I assure you is not going to happen as a result of either of these two events. Next slide. We are not going to have a global meltdown. We are not going to head into World War Z. I don't know if you've had a chance to see this film. It's not Brad Pitt's greatest work, but it's about a pandemic. It happens to be a zombie pandemic, but the backstory of it is that the world, as a result of a pandemic and collapsing leadership, ends up in a massive world war. We are not headed there. But there will be winners and losers geopolitically. So let's talk about a couple of those. And let's begin, next slide, with China. China will emerge stronger from this pandemic, principally because they have managed to control the virus very effectively. Why? Because they have authoritarian tools simply not available to us here in the United States. But as a result, their economy will be a so-called V-shape economy, already is, coming out of it strongly, and you'll see them continue to take a very challenging path with the United States. Next slide. If I were going to categorize the, here's a term we've all learned, pre-existing conditions in the U.S.-China relationship, they're on this slide. Upper left, cyber, conflict in the cyberspace. Upper right, an expanding Chinese military. Bottom right, trade and tariff disagreement. Bottom left, you may not recognize, that's an artificial island. China is building artificial islands in the South China Sea. And in the center, 5G, Huawei, the arguments over 
who will provide the backbone to the global cyber network going forward. These are challenges. Next slide. And you will see China use these tools aggressively. They will use cyber very capably. They have a well-defined, very capable cyber force, just like we have an army, a navy, an air force, a marine corps. China has all of those. They also have a cyber force. Next slide. Give you a practical example of how they use it. At the top is an F-35 Lightning, also known as a Joint Strike Fighter. It's the most advanced fifth generation jet in the world. At the bottom, that exact copy is a Chinese J-22. It's an exact copy because China took the stealth characteristics, which they hacked using cyber. Next slide. You'll see China aggressively pursue its claims to this body of water, the South China Sea. China claims this body of water in its entirety. It is a preposterous claim. It is a body of water the size of the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico combined. Can you imagine the United States simply claiming all of that water space? China wants it because there are hydrocarbons there, oil, gas, and because 40% of the world's shipping passes through that region. Next slide. To buttress these claims, they're building those artificial islands. I showed you that picture upper right bottom center is the result of an artificial island. China has built nine of these. They have airstrips, radars, missiles, troops, tanks. They are, in Navy parlance, unsinkable aircraft carriers. China is building them in order to control this massive body of water. Next slide. And China will also draw closer and closer to Russia. And if you want a practical example of that, bottom left, largest military exercise since the end of the Cold War was conducted on the Siberian border. Hundreds of thousands of troops from China and Russia. You see the troops hugging each other at the end of the exercise. Bottom right, Chinese destroyer, Russian frigate operating together, not where you would expect them in the North Pacific, this photograph was taken a few weeks ago in the Baltic Sea, in the heart of Europe. Next slide. So how does this come out? China, United States, we don't know. But one thing I will tell you for sure is that China will continue to expand and grow and execute their global strategy as they come out of the pandemic stronger geopolitically. Next slide. Let's take a look at Europe, our greatest pool of partners in the world. Europe will come out neutral coming out of the pandemic. They are handling it better than we are here in the United States, not as effectively as China. As they conclude Brexit, which will occur over the next few weeks, finally, after three to four years, and if you put a gun to my head, I'd predict that ultimately they will cut a deal between exiting Great Britain and the European Union. But as they conclude, however it ends, with a deal or a crash out, Europe will then be in a position to work together more cohesively. Next slide. And you will see Europe and the European Union step up globally. There's good leadership at the European Union marvelous woman physician, uh, doctor, former minister of defense of Germany, Ursula von der Leyen, somebody I know very well leads the European Union. Uh, Christine Lagarde has left the uh, IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and is running the European banking system. They have good leadership. I think they will emerge neutral coming out of this. Uh, President Trump, uh, made history by visiting with Kim Jong-un in North Korea. Uh, you know, however you view that, we certainly seem to have bought up ourselves some time with the North Koreans. How do you think that the Biden administration will handle that? Will they try to go back to a six-country talk 
uh, posture or will, or will they follow the Trump model and try to deal with Kim Jong-un directly? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say I commend President Trump for reaching out to Kim, and I think it was worth a try. Um, and I think a number of things just didn't come to fruition, and there are a lot of reasons for that that we could go into. But, um, you know, Einstein said that the greatest form of madness is to just keep doing the same thing and thinking you're going to have a different result. Um, President Trump came in, looked at 50 years of trying the same thing, and decided to try personal diplomacy. It didn't work. It was worth a try. What I think the Biden team will do is not go back to the 50 failed years, but I think they'll come at it with two new ideas. One is to much more fully acquiesce in the idea that we have got to solve this with China. Remember my comment, confront where we must, cooperate where we can. This is a big potential zone of cooperation. Both US and China have real interest in doing this. All roads to Pyongyang, the capital in North Korea, lead through Beijing. So number one, I think they'll work much more closely with China. And your point, six party talks, I think is part of this, but it's really gonna be US China constructing a new modality. And that's part two. I think we're going to have to recognize the reality of Kim having a small nuclear arsenal. It's a reality. We are gonna pry those weapons out of his cold, dead hands. And it's not going to work without a war that'll kill three or four million people. So what we ought to do is recognize he's got about 50, mil, 50 of these weapons. And we ought to focus instead on stopping construction of new ones, but also decoupling those weapons from delivery systems and propose a regime that looks at constraining delivery systems perhaps to include an international force that doesn't go after his nukes, but guards his delivery systems. Again, this becomes a complicated technical discussion. It hasn't been tried. Those are two new ideas. I suspect the Biden team is gonna wanna try something new. I don't think they will go back to personal diplomacy. Again, I commend President Trump for giving it a try. It just didn't work. One question that we had from our viewers, uh, you mentioned in your opening remarks that we might expect a major cyber event in 2021. Can you give us some more details on what you think that might be? I can. Um, unfortunately, um, the cyber risk has been sort of overshadowed by COVID. But if you think of cyber as sort of operating, cyber risk is operating on three vectors. One is hacktivism. Um, terrorists, political actors, all of the people that um, think they are doing things for political benefit on the internet, think Edward Snowden uh, type of events. That's one vector. A second one is cyber criminal activity, which is massive. Um, the global economy is about $81 trillion a year annually in GDP. About $1 trillion of that is touched by cyber criminal activity. And it emanates from six, seven, eight nations globally, including our own United States, including Israel, but also from Russia, China, Nigeria, Vietnam, uh, Ukraine, a handful of others. So cyber criminal activity, that's for profit operations. That's a second vector. And the third vector is national state actions. So Russia and China most obviously, but also North Korea has strong capability here. Iran has strong capability. Nation states who will try and create uh, challenges for us ahead. I think of those three vectors, terrorism and hacktivism, cyber criminal activity and nation state activity, I am most concerned in 2021 with nation state activity. I think um, terrorism is coming down a little bit. Um, Islamic State has some presence, but not hugely capable. Cyber criminal activity continues, but we're getting better at positioning ourselves against that. So 
what I really worry about is an attack masked either by Russia or China, or perhaps from Iran or North Korea that goes after some critical part of our infrastructure, our electric grid, our transportation system, our educational system, our medical system. Um, even as we're in the midst of distributing these vaccines, those who would do us ill are already trying to penetrate these uh, pharmaceutical companies that are executing these big contracts. So there's a lot to worry about here. There's a lot that we're doing well, but as the Biden administration comes in, I would hope they will put a significant focus on nation state cyber activity. That's what we ought to be significantly concerned about. Admiral James Stavridis, former Supreme Allied Commander, uh, Florida is proud of you. Uh, thanks for being with us t this evening, and we look forward to welcoming you to the Palm Beach Atlantic campus in person once we get through this pandemic.